Major funding for Carolina Business Review is provided by Grant Thornton, an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. Novant Health, including Presbyterian in Charlotte and Forsyth in Winston-Salem, are affiliate heart hospitals of the Cleveland Clinic, consistently ranked number one in the nation for heart care. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, proudly serving South Carolinians since 1946. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. There are not too many more politically or emotionally polarizing points than the topic of education. Delivering it, measuring it, funding it. And here in the Carolinas, we tend to be pretty proud of our centers of learning, especially colleges and universities. Welcome and thank you for supporting the most widely watched program on Carolina business and public policy for over two decades now. In particular, the last few years have been uncommonly acute when it comes to education funding and setting priorities. Brutal, in fact. In a moment, joining us again, someone with arguably one of the toughest and most critical jobs in the old North State, UNC System President Tom Ross. Major funding also by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation in Charlotte enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs. Join Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. This edition of Carolina Business Review was recorded August 17, 2012. On this week's program, an executive profile featuring Thomas Ross, president of the University of North Carolina. Now, Chris William. Hello, welcome to our program. As always, we have great conversation before and right after the program, but we're going to keep it going. President Ross, uh, welcome to the Thank program. Thank you very much, Chris. Glad to be here. It, it, good, good to have you here. Uh, Tom, let, I mean, let's start, let's start pretty broad. Uh, you know, we all talk about funding education. We all talk about prioritizing education. You talk about uh, teacher salaries in the case of, uh, of UNC, the UNC system. You talk about uh, professors and, and tenure and, and branding. But let's come back to this whole, whole notion that is a four-year degree, number one, is it really needed the way it, it was needed a decade ago? And is it really worth the value? I think it's actually more needed today than ever before. And really all you need to do is look at um, the data. Um, in North Carolina, during the last recessionary period that we've been through, beginning in 2007, I guess, actually, but certainly by 2008 and continuing to today, uh, unemployment among individuals with a bachelor's degree or higher uh, has, at its highest point, been at about 4.5%. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. unemployment among people with a high school degree uh, has been much higher than that um, in the 12 to 15 percent range. So your chances of being employed are definitely better in North Carolina and nationally, by the way, because our data tracks the national data, uh, if you have a bachelor's degree or higher. Now, look at earnings. Uh, if you look at the data again, over your lifetime, you will earn about a million dollars more if you have a bachelor's degree than if you have a high school degree. Uh, so clearly it's worth it. Mm -hmm. It's worth the investment uh, that a family makes and that a student makes um, in terms of real dollar return. But I think even more than that, it's worth it to society to have a well-educated populace. Uh, and you know, when we look at what the future holds for North Carolina and what kind of economy we're going to have, uh, we're going to need a higher uh, educated workforce if we're mm -hmm. going to be able to meet the workforce needs of our businesses. And, you know, one of the things that's made North Carolina great uh, is we've got a great workforce. We've got people who work hard, who have a, a really good work ethic, um, but they need quality education both at our community colleges, our public schools, and at our universities if they're going to be prepared mm -hmm. for tomorrow's uh, economy. Yeah, I, I want to go back. We were talking also a little bit before the program about this this article that appeared in the economy, recent edition of The Economist magazine, and you've heard this probably ad nauseum, and that is 
the spiraling cost, the calamity of college costs. And I want to quote something from this article. It said, higher education has not delivered extra value to, manage, to, to match the extra cost. Uh, is there some level of truth in that? Well, I, I don't know. I'd have to go back and look at the whole article to see exactly what they're referring to. But, you know, let's think about uh, a degree from one of our universities. Um, you know, if you if you come to any one of them, the tuition number is south of eight thousand mm -hmm. dollars a year. Now, there are other costs, there are fees, there are housing, food. But of course, housing and food, somebody's going to have that cost whether they're at a university or not. Uh, but there's going to be some more cost over and above tuition. Uh, but it's still going to be something well south of, of uh, fifteen or twelve thousand dollars a year. So if you graduate in four years. Um, and you've got, you know, a, a $50,000 degree. Uh, well, again, if you go back and look at those numbers I quoted a minute ago, and you're going to earn a million dollars more of your lifetime, clearly, even at mm -hmm. today's cost, it's worth it. Now, in North Carolina, we're fortunate uh, in a couple of ways. Our tuition at all of our public institutions uh, is very near the very bottom of the lowest quartile among their peers. Let me say that again. If you, if you look at the peers of each of our institutions and say, well, how does our tuition stack up? We are in the lowest quartile and near the bottom of that quartile for every one of our institutions, which means we've got some of the lowest tuition in America. Now, how can that be? Well, we've had a very supportive legislature. Mm -hmm. um, we've had a supportive legislature last year. We've had a supportive legislature 50 years ago and 100 years ago. Uh, because they have seen the value of higher education and invested in higher education. So our state support is higher than many states. Um, people in North Carolina have seen the value of investing in education, and I think that, as I said earlier, the jobs of tomorrow are going to require it. So we need, need to continue to make that investment. We have a responsibility to spend that money wisely and to invest it carefully, mm -hmm. uh, and I think we're trying to do that. We're looking at a number of ways to be more efficient uh, and to lower the cost of, of higher education. But North Carolina has pretty low cost already, so it's a good deal here, it, probably better than in some states. It, it, squ square it with the idea, when you look south of the border, when you look in South Carolina, you see USC gets less than now 10 percent of their budget from that's it's allocated from the state house in Columbia. And, w and we all know what tuition has done over the last decade uh, continues to spiral. I think media, uh, uh, tuition is, is, is a measure of median income went from 25 percent to 30 plus percent now and continues to escalate. I guess the question then, President Ross, we come back to, is this a sustainable acceleration of student cost? How, when does it slow down? Does it ever slow down? And how do you maintain that? Yeah. Well, again, I think that I think that's a, a valid point and one that we all have to look at carefully, because I think it has grown at a much faster pace than perhaps we can sustain. And there are reasons for that, some of which have applied to business as well, like the exploding cost of technology that we've been mm -hmm. through in the last 20 years in this country. Businesses have invested huge amounts in technology. They've had to. Uh, banks and everybody else have had to. They've had to produce online banking and all sorts of things. So they've made big investments. We've had to do the same thing. Um, you know, I, I don't know enough about the University of South Carolina to get in the business of comparison, and I'm not sure it'd be very valid anyway. But you know, there, there, um, you know, there is a relationship, and, and one only again needs to look at the data between the amount of money a state invests and the tuition mm -hmm. that students pay. So it's sort of where does that shift occur? You know, do you believe that there's a, a general value to higher education in your state to help have an educated workforce and attract businesses? Um, and if so, then I think a state uh, rightly ought to invest. But there has to be a balance between tuition and between mm -hmm. uh, state investment, I think. Another key to me is accessibility. Um, and, and one of the advantages of having low tuition is you don't have to have as much financial aid support because your tuition's lower. Uh, and that's been very helpful to North Carolina. Um, but when you raise tuition, as we've had to do, um, in order to meet some of the cuts that we've sustained, then you're going to have to have more financial aid demand if you're going to remain accessible. And so those are the dilemmas that all of us in higher education mm -hmm. are facing, whether it's in South Carolina, North Carolina, or Nevada. How, how do, you know, you, you talk about student aid, you talk about tuition. How, how do you take, how do you come to the number, what is the number for North Carolina, first of all, that the, the, the amount of money that's raised in tuition that goes to the student aid, what is that number how and and I guess how do you square that number 
with those kids and those families that are paying that full tuition based on what their economic needs and and how do you square that with the student aid person right. I am. yeah I mean that's the debate our board's having right now yeah. actually we just had a long discussion about it at our last board meeting um, you know the number uh, uh, the percentage of uh, new tuition revenue that's dedicated to financial aid varies from campus to campus um, our board policy before I came uh, our tuition plan required at least 25% of that to be uh, of uh, new tuition revenue to be set aside to support financial aid. Um, on the, and the theory is that I think students at every socioeconomic uh, part of the strata uh, benefit from being around and, and in, in contact with each other, mm -hmm. that they learn from each other. That sort of socioeconomic diversity is important to kids learning how to get along in a global economy. So there is an advantage to students even that are paying full tuition to have students that need financial aid on the campus with them. Uh, I think that's part of the theory, and then, uh, but but you know, our board is looking at that very question because you can make the argument, I think, very rationally that the state ought to provide the needed financial aid right. uh, through tax revenue that all of us uh, pony up, as opposed to having just some families uh, pay mm -hmm. a portion of it, and that's where, frankly, most of the financial aid does come from, from the lottery or from state appropriations or from the federal government, not from. Uh, families, but some of it does come from families. So our board's looking at that right now. Um, you know, I, I don't know where it will come out in, uh, in mm -hmm. that discussion uh, because there, you know, there are strong arguments on both sides, and I think our board is trying to figure out, you know, what is right for North Carolina. And it does vary, by the way, state to state, all over the country. Yeah, yeah you know, a lot of things, and we've got only half an hour to get some of the most critical things <laughs> in. One of the unique things about the system that you that you sit on top of, that you are responsible for, 17 campuses oldest public uh, university in this country. Uh, it's very storied, uh, great, great history to it. And it, it, it seems like it's, from the outside, at least President Ross, it seems like it's going through some, some growing pains. And one of the issues that comes up is you've got all these 17 kids with all these 17 personalities, with all these different cultures. Um, UNC Chapel Hill has been going through some, some really tough issues around, of course, student athletes, um, of course, the African American Studies program, of course, the whole idea of, of credibility is on the line here. I, I, you know, I don't want to ask you about Chancellor Thorpe or what the conversations are going on, that who was right, who knew what, but I, I guess when it comes and it boils out into the public, what role does corporate governance or does board governance have in a situation like Chapel Hill or like some of the other things that have happened in the system over the years. How, how does the board weigh in? Weigh in? How, give us, characterize this for yeah. us. Um, well, let me first say that I think the situation at Chapel Hill, everybody believes is deplorable. Uh, I mean, we cannot have an institution, as you say, that is as storied and uh, as is highly recognized around the country uh, to have this kind of academic integrity problem. We just can't have it. We've got to fix it. Uh, we're about that business. I think there was a new commission announced uh, just yesterday that former Governor Martin will chair uh, along with some independent audit firm that's going to come in and, and take us back even further so that we're sure we know everything that happened, who was involved, and that we're dealing with the problem in the right way, finding all the right remedies. Uh, Chapel Hill has, uh, has already done um, I think three or four different reports. Mm -hmm. uh, the Board of Governors is now reviewing mm -hmm. it. Uh, there have been a number of changes that have been made already to ensure that this kind of thing can't happen again. Um, so it's very serious. Uh, it requires a lot of attention from, from me, uh, from Chancellor Thorpe, from his board, the Board of Trustees, as well as from the Board of Governors. Um, the question of governance, I think, is, is an always important one. And as I think we've learned in, with other institutions, um, Gov our Board of Governors and the Board of Trustees has a very important role to play uh, in oversight and monitoring what's taking place in this kind of situation. And that's one of the reasons we, we came together, the, the, as me as president and, and our board chair, to appoint this Board of Governors review panel. Uh, because the Board of Governors has the ultimate responsibility mm -hmm. for the university system. They're elected by the legislature. And, and so, you know, they need to take a look at this and they need to be satisfied that everything that can be done is being done. Uh, at Chapel Hill to be certain that this problem gets fixed. And that's really what their focus is. Mm -hmm. Let's fix this problem because, you know, we have to. It's too critical to the university. I think you'll see this board, uh, this panel that we've, we've appointed, also look at... The internal panel or the external the, the panel? The Board of Governors panel. But okay. I think the, the, uh, we'll learn from what the external panel does as well. But what, 
we really ought to have our eye on here uh, is are there things we can learn from what happened that we can be sure are fixed first at Chapel Hill and then take the best practices in fixing those and spread them out among all of our campuses so that we don't run the risk of this happening somewhere else. Um, you know, big time athletics and its relationship with academics is under stress constantly at every institution that has an athletic mm -hmm. program. We all know that. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is an example of that tension gone awry, in my view. And so we got to figure out how to how to balance that. And I think that's another step that Chancellor Thorpe has taken, which is the right one to bring in an outside group chaired by one of the most respected college presidents ever uh, that can come in and say, what is the right balance here? How do we ensure that students who are athletes have a real solid, strong academic experience as part of their athletics? Mm -hmm. uh, and how, to, how do, does the institution balance that so that it doesn't get out of kilter uh, and doesn't get drawn by the big money of college athletics? And I think that's the struggle we face. Um, and we, we first got to get to the bottom of fixing this at Chapel Hill. And then we've got to be sure that we have every possible measure in place to be sure it doesn't happen mm -hmm. anywhere else. And I think our board, along with me, uh, need to be sure that's what's going on at Chapel Hill, first of all, but at all of our campuses. That's our job. Do, do, do you have the confidence that Chancellor Thorpe has the credibility to be able to see this through and do the investigation the way it needs to get done? You know, Chancellor Thorpe, when, when this first happened, uh, immediately appointed a group on the faculty to investigate it. Uh, when the report was done, you know, he could have taken the position, well, this is personnel information, mm -hmm. I'm not going to disclose it. But he, had, under the law, he has the ability to to essentially, for the good of the institution, give up the personnel protection and disclose it. And that's what he did, uh, which I think was the right thing. Uh, since then, he has tried to take numerous steps along the way to get the problem fixed. You know, he, this first review went back five years. Some people think we ought to go mm -hmm. more, so now he's appointed a group that's going to go back more. Uh, some people thought, that, you know, that it was good to have the faculty look at this. He did that with a separate faculty committee. Others think it need to be an independent group. So now there's an independent group that's going to go back. So I think he's responding and trying to be sure that we do everything we can to satisfy people uh, that the institutional mm -hmm. integrity is being restored. Um, I think we'll see how it plays out. You know, I, I think Chancellor Thorpe has done many great things. That institution last year raised the second highest level of money mm -hmm. it's ever raised. You know, it's got... Uh, one of the best records of attracting research dollars uh, to its campus, over almost $800 million uh, last year alone um, from outside sources that come to the mm -hmm. campus to support research that's going on. And, you know, if you look at the economic impact just of that and realize that 37 jobs, 36, 37 jobs in North Carolina are, are directly or indirectly supported by that mil for every $1 million of grant money. 37 mm -hmm. jobs for every $1 million. And you brought in $800 million? That's a lot of jobs mm -hmm. and it has a big impact on the economy. So there's a lot of great things going on at Chapel Hill. And with any leader, you've got to balance all of that. Uh, and, and I don't think people realize all the other great things that are happening at the institution that we have to remember. You, you know, uh, former assistant president uh, Bill Friday sat on this program and, and has said it more than just being on this program. But he, he, t he talked about the... the um, uh, dismay that he had with the way that sports has evolved at public universities like UNC Chapel Hill, but not, not exclusively at UNC Chapel Hill. So is, I guess, President Ross, is this, is this another example of some of the distorting effect that big money sports within college athletics can do to what an academic program is meant to do? Um, you know, I'm somebody who believes that, that athletics and academics can coexist in the right way. Um, I remember when I was at Davidson, there was a USA Today um, headline that I had framed and put in my office called, and the headline was, uh, Books and Hoops Coexist. And, and, and that was true at Davidson. It can be true anywhere. Uh, it's a matter of focus and intentionality, I think. Mm -hmm. where, and, and it's hard. There's no question about it because the money in big-time sports is huge. Uh, and it's not just the money that is generated by TV networks and, and that sort of thing. It's... You know, it's, a, it's one of the primary ways that donors continue to identify with their institution, that alumni continue to identify with their institution is through sports. And, you know, a, as I think we were talking earlier, uh, a lot of resources that come to our institutions come through private donations. Um, they're not all because of mm -hmm. athletics, but some of them certainly are. And so you have to keep some perspective about that part of the pie as well. 
there are also students that come to an institution because they want to be a student, but they also want to be a fan. Uh, and so if you didn't have athletics, you know, that would be something that maybe steered mm -hmm. them off to, to a different kind of place. And so there are lots of interactions on a campus between athletics and academics. The key is to have a focus on doing it the right way. Following the rules, being sure that student athletes are in fact athletes and students, mm -hmm. uh, and to be sure that there is academic integrity in the program and that you're making that a, a, a priority no matter what else happens. Whether you win or lose, academics have got to be a priority. And I think that's, um, that's what we've all got to focus on. It, it's, I think people who say, well, we all just do away with, with sports, uh, maybe miss some of the other interactions on a campus mm -hmm. that require that that they not require but justify I think they're being a part of the institution. Yeah, you know, and I don't want this program to be a, a typical example of well, geez, and, and you're thinking in your head, well, here I am talking about the challenges that we have. But what you know, when you're fighting this battle for well, what's the tuition increase going to be? What's the board going to want to do as a relationship of student aided tuition? What 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 about UNC Chapel Hill? What about uh, a consolidation? What about tenure? When you get through all of these things. Things. What do you think it's lost in the noise of the short-term branding issues? What do you think it's lost and missed about not just the UNC system, President Ross, but the larger issue on why it works or why we need to change? What, what gets lost here? Well, a lot, I think, unfortunately. I mean, some of our biggest challenges aren't even the ones you've mentioned. You know, if you, if you think about where we are in society, um, in, in a it, we're no longer thinking about our economy being global. It is global. There is no question about that. Uh, when you think about the role of technology, uh, and, and we're, it, in the university, we're facing real challenges with how do we, how do we take advantage of technology in the best way? Um, and, and, you know, there, there's all sorts of interesting stuff going on right now. Stanford and MIT are putting online classes up for free. You can't get credit for them, but they're putting them up there. So is there a way we could take advantage of that? You know, could a professor in a classroom say, I want you to go home tonight and I want you to watch the online lecture of Professor so-and-so at MIT on this particular principle of physics. And then tomorrow when you come to class, we're going to work on problems. So we'd call that flipping the classroom where you get your lecture at night and you do your homework mm -hmm. in the classroom where you're supervised by the professor. I don't think I've heard anybody who talks about the disruption that's caused classrooms by technology. I've heard nobody say it's gonna do away with faculty and it's gonna do away with uh, the need for a place of interaction of, of students. You know, they learn a lot from each other and they learn from faculty mm -hmm. and they do it in an in a, in a opportunity where they can interact with each other. But man, there's a lot of stuff we could do with technology in terms of distance learning but, What's but the what holdup for the technology piece? Is it just money? Well, part of it's money, but part of it's retooling faculty to help them understand how to take advantage of that technology. I was about to say, you know, one, one of the parts of society that I don't know much about, but a lot of people can tell you about, is games and how many of our kids play games, mm -hmm. right? Grow up playing games. Well, you know, we ought to be using gaming as a way of teaching a lot more than we do. Uh, and there are some very sophisticated gaming scenario uh, ideas out there that can be used in the classroom. They're being used in the military now. I mean, that's the way we do a lot of mm -hmm. training for our military mm -hmm. is through using games, you know. Uh, and we need to be doing more of that in the classroom. It takes money to develop those, but it also takes helping faculty understand how they can be used better in the classroom. So e-learning if you want to call it that whether it's in the classroom whether it's by distance no matter how you do it is one of our most significant challenges mm -hmm. and we're we're head on to that right now um, i think another big challenge we've got uh, is you know we are facing a world in which people because of the bad economy and because of you know a lot of the articles you're referring to and others who mm -hmm. say you know college has got to be worth it and the only way it can be worth it is if you prepare me for a particular job well, the problem is, if I prepare you for a job that's here today, it may not be here tomorrow, yeah. right? And so we got to prepare you for, to be adaptable and flexible, to be able to do lots of kind of jobs. 
Um, and so that requires a different kind of education than I think either we're used to or that many people think we need. Well, and, and that's going to have to be the last word. And, and what we'll do is we'll just have to have you come back so I'd you can that. talk about the good things that I know you want to glom onto there. Uh, President Ross, this is your second year in the job. We hope that you stay in for several more. Thank you, Thank you for being on the program. My pleasure. Thank you, Chris. Always fun to be with you. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you for watching our program. Until next week, good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation in Charlotte enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton an international accounting tax and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. Novant Health, including Presbyterian in Charlotte and Forsyth in Winston-Salem, are affiliate heart hospitals of the Cleveland Clinic, consistently ranked number one in the nation for heart care. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, proudly serving South Carolinians since 1946. Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.com.